Well, greetings and uh, welcome to the National Concrete Bridge Council Vector uh, webinar. Uh, this is the first webinar of the series that we're going to be doing on uh, concrete durability series. So uh, today's session is on concrete condition assessments. Uh, and again, it's being hosted by the National Concrete Bridge Council in cooperation with Vector. If you're not familiar with the National Concrete Bridge Council, uh, we are an allied organization uh, of uh, industry organizations that are all about promoting concrete bridges. And I won't read the bullets here for you on screen. You can read them uh, as I talk. Um, composed of 10 existing members. We originally started with four members back in the 1980s and have, uh, have really grown particularly recently. And I'd like to particularly recognize the International Concrete Repair Institute who uh, works in this space of concrete bridge preservation. They recently joined our ranks to help us out uh, in this topic of stewardships. So again, this is the first of a six part webinar series and hopefully when you signed up, you signed up for all six sessions. There'll be a session each month, about an hour long. You can see the dates there on screen. I'd encourage you to register for all of them. If you miss one, there's an opportunity, will be an opportunity um, at some point in the future to be able to see the recordings uh, of the sessions. And certainly you'll be getting a professional development hour certificate for participating in the live webinars. So, and in that vein, we are also encouraging your participation uh, during the Q&A at the end. Um, you'll have an opportunity, uh, you'll, you should see a little Q&A pane to be able to type in uh, your questions, put in your name, um, you can ask as many questions as you want. Um, the group here will be judging whoever asks the best question will be picked to receive a $100 Amazon gift card. So, so with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Mr. Brian Pales, uh, who's an, a NACE specialist, um, but he's also uh, works for Vector Corrosion. Um, he's been there for a number of years and has filled a number of roles. Brian, uh, you can see on screen, I won't read sort of all of his accolades in terms of um, his uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD that he holds, um, but very, very much a, a major player in the community uh, when it comes to um, doing bridge and even just general, I'll say, concrete repair projects. Um, and so today, uh, Brian's going to be talking to us again about concrete preservation. Uh, and specifically um, talking about um, concrete durability. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian. So thank you, Brian. Thank you, Greg, for the introduction and uh, thank you for the National Concrete Bridge Council for this opportunity here today. Um, I appreciate everyone joining in today and today I'll be talking about methods and ways that we can look at the evaluation of concrete uh, deterioration so that that can lead us into the preservation area. And I always like to start off with this slide here. Um, here on the left, we see a picture of a, a bridge pier. Most likely there's an expansion joint above there. We see the beams coming in at the beam seat. And we see that somebody has gone around and probably done some um, hammer sounding and, and marked out this white hatched area. And so they've done some hammer sounding. They've identified a large near surface delamination. Uh, that's probably resulted from moisture and chlorides coming down from the expansion joint, contaminating that concrete, causing corrosion, causing um, cracking and eventual delamination of that concrete. Now, if I went to a contractor and I hired a contractor and I said, please repair this. And, you know, we gave him the quantities of the white hatched area. and We said, hey, can you go repair that? Is that really all that needs to be repaired on this structure? I think most people who are familiar with concrete repair work would, would realize that when a contractor takes, say, a chipping hammer to that area, it's going to grow, right? Because the hammer sounding only really finds the large near surface delamination. There's micro cracking and other smaller delaminations beyond that, that when we start hitting it with a chipping hammer, those are going to start to come loose and that concrete's going to come out. So most likely, you know, the contractor's not going to repair just the white part. He's going to end up probably repairing, in addition, maybe that yellow area as well. So we know that that quantity is going to increase. In addition, I think we've all faced this when we do, you know, inspection or evaluation work of structures. 
it may take some time between when we assess that structure to when the repairs actually occur. You know, it may take a year or two before I can, you know, get through the contracting process and get that work done. So that that delamination may grow as well. So we really need to know where the extent of that deterioration is. Um, and so, you know, today I'll talk about what are some methods that we can do to better understand where that yellow area is that can't be identified as the large delamination. But then, you know, if we, okay, let's say we go out, we repair the, the white hatched area and the yellow area. Is that really repairing the structure? I think a lot of people these days, a lot of owners are really looking for pretty significant service life extensions in their structures. You know, um, I see a lot of at minimum, you know, 25 years, 40 years, 50 years. I've been involved in projects with 75 years life extension. So, you know, if I went to this structure and I just repaired what's delaminated and chipped out the white and the yellow part now, am I really repairing that structure for the next 40 years? Am I really preserving it for a long time? Or are there areas also in that pier that are actively corroding that just haven't created a concrete delamination yet? And if I don't address those areas now, am I really making a am I really preserving that pier for the future? And is it going to uh, be an effective service life? And, you know, you could see that red area. That's maybe where corrosion is active because it does have salt and chloride, uh, has chloride exposure, but it may not have created a delamination yet. And so if I only repair the yellow and the, the white, am I really doing what I'm really tasked to and extending the service life of this pier for 50 years? Or do I need to do something to that red area to make it so it doesn't become a delamination over those 50 years? And how do we identify that? And I think the series that we're going to present here with me starting and several of my colleagues is, you know, today I'm going to talk about how do we find and delineate these areas, and then my colleagues will start talking about what we do with those various areas. So to give people a little bit of background, you know, you know, not everyone is, is as familiar with corrosion. Um, and so just to make a clear up a few terms so that people really understand what we're dealing with. Uh, you know, corrosion is an electrochemical reaction. So there's an electrical flow and there's a chemical reaction occurring. Um, and there's actually two main parts of the corrosion reaction. There's the anode on the left here, and that's where iron loses electron and becomes iron oxide. And I think everyone's pretty familiar with the anode side of things. That's where the red rust forms. However, if we remember back to high school chemistry, which may have been, you know, some days ago for most of us, you know, where we lose an electron, we have to gain electron. And so that's the other half of the corrosion reaction, and that's the cathode side. That electron is freed at the anode, causing rust, and that electron is consumed at the cathode, creating, and there's no section loss at the cathode. And when my other colleagues start talking about cathodic protection, what they're really doing is making our structure a cathode and making something else the anode. Um, and the key takeaway is the anode has the section loss, that's where the damage occurs. The cathode, there's no damage loss. Damage loss. Um, so why do we like steel and concrete? What, what is good about concrete? Really, the key factor is the alkalinity of concrete. Concrete is very alkaline, has a pH of around 13. And when we put steel in that high of an alkaline environment, it forms a passive layer. And that passive layer protects it from section loss, protects it from corrosion. And so if we maintain that passivity, our structure will have a nice long life. When that passive layer gets destroyed, that's when corrosion can occur and that's when we have damage of the concrete structures. Now, the two most common things that will cause that deterioration of that passive film are chlorides and carbonation. Now, chlorides, uh, you know, most people are pretty familiar with, you know, de-icing salts, uh, marine environments, um, you know, various sources of salts, but for the bridge world, we're really dealing with, you know, marine environments or de-icing chemicals. Uh, occasionally, and unfortunately, they accidentally get cast due to contaminated materials. But if chlorides get into the concrete, they can break that passive film and allow for corrosion to occur. Now, the real key here is that the chlorides have to reach a certain threshold at the depth of steel to initiate that corrosion reaction. Um, generally, chloride thresholds range depending on you know the materials that you're dealing with. Uh, but generally speaking, about one to two pounds per cubic yard of chloride in uh, pounds of chloride in a cubic yard of concrete is generally enough to break that passive fill. And there are obviously exceptions to that rules. It is a range. 
And, you know, depending, some people use different units. Um, I personally like parts per million, 350 parts per million of concrete or percent by mass of concrete. So those are all units of, of chloride. And so if we have a high level of chloride at the depth of steel that can break that passive film and initiate corrosion. And we test this for primarily looking at the, we take cores or powder samples of concrete structures. We then dice up those samples in increments with depth and we measure the chloride concentration in those samples to determine how the chlorides are getting into the concrete with depth. And we see here, this is uh, what we would call chloride profile. Uh, we see we have a high surface concentration. Uh, and then for three of the curves, we see the concentration drops pretty non-linearly with depth. And we can see the red horizontal line is the threshold of 350 in parts per million. So if we look at these three samples, if we had a cover depth of two inches, that would mean for those three locations, the chloride concentration is below threshold at the depth of steel. So our risk for corrosion activity for those locations is low. Now, if we only had a half inch of, of cover depth, obviously the chloride concentration is quite high and the risk for corrosion would be quite high. In addition, we have two other core samples with their profiles that are quite high and, and relatively flat. And we see they're well above the threshold at the depth of two inches. Um, those locations, the passive film is most likely broken, corrosion is most likely active. And so here, you know, we can see that. And so what's what's really happening in these three cores? The three um, three samples that dip non-linearly, this is a chloride distribution in sound concrete, typically good concrete. It has a, a strong matrix where chloride slowly diffuse from the surface into the concrete. And we see that, you know, it takes time for them to get deep. And we can model this curve to see when these chlorides will reach concentration at certain depths. Now, these two more straight lines, that's typical of what we see when we say have cracking. So these five cores were all collected from the same deck and two of those cores were collected near cracks. And when we have cracks in the concrete, that allows moisture and chlorides to get into the concrete matrix very deep, very quickly. And we see very high concentrations of chloride. Um, and so this really shows the importance of cover depth and also cracking. Um, you know, good quality concrete with good cover depth without cracking, really will create a nice durable structure that will protect the steel from chloride advancement. When we get cracking, that will allow chlorides to get in deeper much faster and initiate our corrosion. Carbonation is another uh, uh, primary cause of corrosion activity in concrete. Uh, carbonation is where carbon dioxide in the environment reacts with the free lime, creating uh, and lowers the pH of the concrete. And here on the right, we can see this is a concrete core that was extracted and the pH indicator solution was sprayed on the exposed surface. And we can see the nice pink color here is where the pH is high. And we see where it's clear, the pH is low. And we can see the boundary of where that carbonation front has advanced. And if that carbonation front reaches the steel, it lowers the pH, breaks that passive film and allows for corrosion to occur. Now, carbonation, when we compare it to chlorides, typically moves slower than chloride. So most people are typically more familiar with chloride corrosion. Uh, carbonation, you know, carbon dioxide in the air is permeating into all concrete structures. The rate at which it's permeating, though, varies significantly based on the, rel uh, the environment, but also the concrete quality. Good quality concrete really has a slow carbonation rate and really takes a long, long time before carbonation is ever an issue. Um, if you have historic structures or con very poor concrete with a high permeability, carbonation can be a problem. Uh, you know, old structures, it's just a matter of time, right? So they've been, you know, you have a structure that's 80 years old. It's just been exposed to carbon dioxide for a very long time. And so that front may have moved deeper than in, say, a structure that's only 10 years old. Um, you know, one thing that we often see carbonation issues, if you have some very low cover depth issues. So sometimes you'll see some early spalling in structures where you have very low concrete cover. And, you know, you tend to get a little bit of a surface carbonation layer on structures. And so if the steel is very close to the surface, that little thin carbonation layer will cause a little bit of localized corrosion where you have low cover. Uh, typically, carbonation induced corrosion is a slower rate corrosion compared to chlorides, uh, but it can be, you know, very uh, damaging to structures. So when we talk about damage and what we're looking for the deterioration, really what's causing the damage to the structure when we talk about corrosion 
is the expansive nature of iron oxide. So we have steel and concrete. When it starts to corrode, it becomes iron oxide and it expands, it grows. And so it can increase in size up to say seven times its original size. And so that's a very expansive product inside concrete. And we know concrete is weaker in tension than it is in compression. So if we have an expansive product inside concrete, that's what creates cracking, delamination, and eventual spalls, is that expansive nature of, of the iron oxide product, of the rust. Now, when we look at corrosion, we also have to be very considerate of the type of reinforcement we're dealing with, whether it's conventional or high strength strands. Uh, you know, the case on the left, that's a conventional reinforced column. We obviously have some corrosion. We have a spall. We see some rust on the bars. Now, there's obviously section loss of those bars, but if, you know, as a structural engineer, if you're looking at that column, you're probably saying, OK, yeah, there's some damage. There's something we probably should address and repair. But most likely from a structural stability point of view, you know, this isn't very concerning. You know, OK, yeah, yes, there's some damage, but it's probably not significantly affecting the capacity of that column or the structure as a whole. And that's because the amount of rust that was required to create that spall may have only caused five or 10 percent, you know, section loss on that bar. So overall, because the bar has a low um, stress in it and, you know, relatively small section loss that created enough expansive product, you know, that's why we're not super concerned. Now, high strength strands, pre-stress and post-tension post strands have a lot of stress in them. They are under a, quite a bit of load. They have a lot of surface area, and generally speaking, they're a smaller diameter. Um, and so a little bit of corrosion product can go quite a little bit further in affecting their structural capacity. And so if we need enough iron oxide to create a spall, like the image on the right, to create enough iron oxide to create that spall actually has you need more section loss of the strand than you would for the conventional bar. So it has a bigger impact on the capacity of that element. So an important thing to do is when we're looking at structures and doing assessments is if that structure is pre-stress or post-tension, we may not want to wait for the signs of spalling and delamination to start addressing rehabilitation. We may want to catch it a little earlier because then we won't have as much deterioration and we could you know, have less costly repairs. You know, if we're waiting for spalls to develop like we would in our conventional reinforcing, then maybe we're going to have some severe section loss and the repairs might be more significant. So with high strength strands and tendons, you know, it's really important not to rely on the visual cues that we use for conventional reinforcement to indicate it's a time to start doing assessment. We want them, if we start seeing some early cracking, we may want to jump on those, those structures a little earlier with assessment than we would say a conventional reinforced structure. So, you know, today I'm going to really talk about assessment with regards really around non-destructive testing and methods that we can use to assess the condition of reinforced concrete structures. Um, you know, one, you know, his, we do a lot of visual and hammer sounding chain drag inspection of bridges. That's a very standard inspection method. It's very effective at identifying deterioration, but what kind of deterioration is it finding? You know, here is a curve, uh, you know, reinforced concrete condition on the vertical, time on the bottom. And, you know, here's a typical chloride induced corrosion deterioration mechanism. We start with chloride and moisture penetration. We then get reinforcing steel corrosion. That leads to iron oxide formation. That starts to lead to cracking, delamination, and then eventual spalling. So if we only use hammer sounding chain drag visual inspection from our tool bag, we're really identifying later stage delamination. If you recall my first slide when I was showing where the hammer sounding found that large delamination, yes, it's very effective at finding that delamination, but is that the only condition affecting that structure? All of these conditions that I show on the top are happening simultaneously at different parts of a structure. So if we have spalling in one location, we probably have varying degrees of delamination in another. We probably have rebar corrosion in another that's developing. And we probably have areas that aren't corroding yet, but are just starting to get chloride and moisture penetration. So if we're going out to really assess a structure for a long rehabilitation, it's really important that we not just find what's damaged today, but we understand where that damage is going so that we can really develop proper repair strategies for a long service life extension. And there are tools that we can use beyond chain drag and hammer sounding to help us with that. And, you know, I want to make it clear, you know, it's important still to do hammer sound, chain drag, and visual. Those are tools that always should be used, but these tools can be used in addition to help get a more 
complete understanding of the structure so we can get a more complete rehabilitation and extend that service life more effectively. And so I'll talk about a few of these, how they work and some examples of them. So I always start with uh, corrosion potential measurements. As a corrosion engineer, corrosion scientist, this is one of the most common tools in our tool bag. Uh, corrosion potential measurements measure the corrosion potential of embedded reinforcing steel. Um, and so here we use a reference electrode, typically copper, copper sulfate. We measure the potential of that reference electrode versus the embedded steel reinforcement. Uh, this is ASTM 876. And by looking at the potential, we can tell the probability of active corrosion at the location we're measuring. And so here you see on the right, a gentleman, he's done hammer sounding. He's found where the physical damage is today. Now he's doing corrosion potentials beyond that to identify where is that active, where is that deterioration going to go? And do, you know, is it, is that damage going to expand that we should do something now to prevent it from getting to that point? Uh, this is a, a bridge deck evaluation. You can see this is a corrosion potential survey uh, of a bridge deck. Now, this bridge deck is very late in its uh, deterioration life. Uh, you can see there's a lot of active corrosion on there. Um, and we can see, you know, the hot colors indicating where active corrosion is. And if we overlay the delamination survey, it tells us a lot of good information. We can see the hatch areas are where there's delaminated concrete. So if we just did the chain drag survey and we saw these DLAMs, we could then say, okay, hey, let's hire a contractor to go repair those, and, and that would be fine. But if we're looking at this from an owner perspective, we look at those delaminations, but then we look at the potentials around it, and we see that corrosion activity is really large around those areas of delamination. So if I just repair those delaminations today, it looks like I'm going to have a lot of delaminations in the next four or five years that I'm going to have to repair again. So does it really make sense from an owner perspective to do repair on this when I could probably, you know, replace this deck at this point? You know, so it kind of helps me decide on, OK, hey, are those maintenance dollars I'm going to spend today going to be useful for the next years? Or should I spend more dollars to do re replacement at this point and really understanding where that damage is going? So it can really help understand how to use those dollars effectively so that we're not just chasing repairs for every five years and if the you know if the owner has the funds maybe deck replacements worth it in this situation to preserve those funds you know um you know that was a deck this happens to be a a, a bridge pier as well so you can do it on any kind of surfaces of reinforced concrete structures so this is actually a um this happens to be a railroad bridge but a bridge nonetheless uh it was at grade and they built a road down below it so that the cars didn't have to stop at the overpass uh didn't have to stop at the railway when they were crossing and so because of that because we're below grade in this kind of quasi boat section element here uh, a lot of water pools up down in here during rainstorms and then de-icing salts get down in here. This happens to be in a, Missouri, a bridge from Missouri. And so because of that, we get a lot of splashing of water and chlorides on the pier elements. And you can see there's the kind of the crash wall footer here, and then you have the columns and then the pier cap and the bridge. And so when we go out to survey a structure like this, what we found was we saw the hatching areas. You can see where the delaminations were occurring on the columns. And we see a lot of active corrosion in the lower half of the columns where they're getting really direct spray of water and salt. Now, it's kind of interesting here is that I don't see a lot of active corrosion in the crash wall. Now, if I go back real quick, we can see that the crash wall is right next to the road, right? So one would kind of assume before getting into this project, well, that little crash wall footer is right next to the roadway. It's going to get the most water and salt. Maybe that's where the most active corrosion is. And so if I look at this, I'm kind of like, well, why isn't I why aren't I seeing a lot of active corrosion in that? Well, and I'll get to this here in a second, but what ended up actually happening was we surveyed the cover depth on the columns and crash wall and found that while the exposure to the crash wall was severe, if not you know, similar to the bottom half of the columns, the cover depth was deeper in the in the footer than into the columns. So while the chloride exposure, actually the chloride profiles for the column and footer look very similar, because the steel is a little bit deeper in the crash wall, we just aren't initiating corrosion yet. So that gives us a lot of indication of like, okay, you know, we can model out those chloride profiles and see when when that footer crash wall is going to become active, and maybe we can do some preservation techniques now to prevent that corrosion. Obviously, with the columns, we have to do something now to repair because we have damage and very severe active corrosion. And so, you know, corrosion potentials tell us where that active corrosion is, 
but doing chloride profiles as well as looking cover depth, we can really understand not only where that corrosion is now, but where is it going? And we get in place cover depth typically using ground penetrant radar. Uh, ground penetrant radar is a very versatile tool. Uh, this is an electromagnetic device that we can scan concrete and look for, um, and it's really good at identifying where steel is in concrete because the electrical properties of concrete versus steel are very different. And so GPR will reflect off of changes in the electrical permittivity or conductivity. Um, and so obviously steel is a conductor, concrete is an insulator. And so we see con uh, steel and concrete very nicely. And so here's an example scan. Uh, this is the top of the concrete surface. And you see these white uh, reflections here, these hyperbolas, these are the reinforcing bars. And so we can tell what the cover depth of those bars are. We can tell the spacing of those bars. And so that can be very useful. In addition, we can also see that the reflection on the left side is very bright, but the reflection on the right is a little not as strong. They're faded. So what's causing that? Well, the GPR signal strength is affected by a lot of things. Cover depth, uh, quality of the concrete, uh, if there's moisture and chlorides in the concrete, if there's a lot of cracking and deterioration. So there's a lot of things related to corrosion and deterioration that will weaken a GPR signal. So GPR can be used to do this qualitative condition assessment to say, hey, these areas of attenuation are areas of potential deterioration. And I really strongly indicate potential. Um, a lot of times I've heard out in the industry, you know, I'll be talking to people and they'll say, Oh, GPR, you know, I hired a guy to go out and do GPR to find a, uh, do a delamination survey on a deck for me and it didn't work very well. Well, that does not surprise me because GPR is not really designed to do a delamination survey. Yes, delaminations will cause attenuation of the signal, but I cannot tell you the difference in attenuation from a delamination or maybe that area just has a lot of moisture and chlorides and it's causing attenuation. Now, that may lead to a delamination and corrosion in the future, but it does not mean it is now. So it's not an effective tool to go out and delineate delaminations. Now, it will get affected by them, but you cannot delineate those areas effectively. And so I think that's a real big caution when people do this attenuation survey is it's, it's really looking at areas of potential deterioration, areas we should look at further. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So with um, you know reinforcement layout, it's really good, especially when we're missing drawings or we don't have as-built plans. Uh, a lot of times we get hired in when people are doing load rating of bridges to look for and confirm the reinforcement placing, make sure that when they're doing their load rating calcs, they have the right reinforcement patterns. Um, and you can see you know things like you know on a slab deck, we can see this black thick line is the bottom of the slab. Uh, we have an integral beam into that slab and we see where that beam drops down. So we're scanning from the top and we can see exactly where that beam is. Uh, we're scanning along the length of a beam and we can see how the shear reinforcement changes at the beam end towards the beam middle. And so that spacing increases as it gets out towards the middle where there's less shear. Um, so we can you know, exactly identify where all those bars are and what the spacing is. Um, you know, on you know, ashto type girders where you have strands that deviate up and down based on the length uh, at the position of the beam, identifying where those are in the exact position uh, and the number of pre stressed strands at the bottom um, and number of layers and things like that. So we can accurately develop these drawings when those plans have been lost or confirming plans to make sure that it was built as it should have been. Uh, this is a nice example. These are some adjacent box beam girders. Um, the drawing specified that this, there should have been 12 strands in the top and tw two rows of 27 strands at the bottom. You know, doing GPR scanning on them actually identified seven strands on the top, eight and the and row of eight and 11 on those. And what actually would happen was uh, they increased the strand size when they made these things, when they made these pre-stress girders. So um, because of the strand increase in size, they were able to lower the number, but they didn't properly document that in the as builts. And so there was a, a deviation from what the drawing said to what was actually built, and this was confirmed by GPR. And so now the, the engineer can verify the load capacity of this element because now his diameter has changed and his quantity has changed, and so we can redo those calculations. Uh, I mentioned cover depth is very important. Um, cover depth, um, you know, a few equations here to show how important cover depth is. Uh, we can see this; these two equations right here on the left, 
This is the equation we use for chloride concentration at some depth x at some time t. And we see um, C naught is the surface exposure, uh, X is depth, D sub C is the rate at which chlorides move through the concrete, and T is time. So if I want to know at the depth of my steel, when will it get to threshold concentration? When will threshold occur so it causes corrosion? So if I set CXT equal to my threshold and I want to solve for T, I see that X becomes squared. And that's important because the cover depth has a real big has an exponential impact on the time it takes for chlorides to diffuse into the concrete and reach threshold at the steel. So, so good quality cover really provides good protection over the long term for our structure. Provides a very durable structure. Now, I caution people. You know, you don't want to take away from that and say, "Oh, okay, let's put seven inches of concrete cover on all our structures. We'll never have a chloride problem again." Well, if you did that, you'd never be able to control cracking, right? Steel out near the surface helps control cracking, uh, shrinkage and bending stresses. And so we want a very, we want, need to have a balance, right? We need to have good quality cover, but we also want to have, we want to control cracking from stress or from, you know, from curing stress and things like that. So we have to really balance that together to make sure we have good quality cover with no cracking. Uh, the simpler equation is actually for carbonation depth, and again, d squared for time. Uh, and so we can GPR uh, various structures, and we can look at what the cover depth is in place and map that out. And you can see, you know, mapping certain areas, we can see there's areas of low concrete cover. Those are areas that are going to be at risk for carbonation-induced corrosion early in the structure service life. And so maybe in those areas, we can apply preventative means to prevent that corrosion because we know the area of low cover, unfortunately, exists there. This is my, you know, when I was mentioning attenuation survey, this is a good example of this. Uh, this is a bridge in uh, in Florida. It's on the Gulf side of Florida, so the West Coast. So if we see we have a bridge here and we have the Gulf of Mexico on the left side and the mainland of Florida on the right side. And we happen to see that there's a marina here. And so this bridge has a very high arch. So you can see that this is about the midpoint of the bridge. So it's a very steep climb up and down each side. And we did a GPR attenuation survey on the deck. Now in Florida, we don't have snow, so we don't do de-icing salts. Generally speaking, we're more worried about substructure elements here. However, in this case, because of that marina, what was happening was on the weekends, people would take their boats over to the coast, drive them when they're nice, dry and clean over the bridge, go to the marina, put them in, have a nice weekend of fishing. And then when they pull the boats out, you know, you're supposed to wash down your boat, clean it and then drive away. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't do that. They trailer their boat, pull up and drive over the bridge. And so as a result, you've got a boat dripping in salt water that is now driving over the bridge. And so you can see, we see a lot of attenuation in that eastbound lane where the wet boats are going. And we see that attenuation is really at the beginning of the bridge where the boat, the driver is going uphill. So uh, if you're familiar with boats, the water goes back to the back of the boat where the, the bilge is, and that's where the water will leak out. And then when he goes over the crest of the bridge, that water moves to the front and generally doesn't leak out as much. I'm only clipping the first half of the bridge here, but the attenuation drops significantly for the rest of the span, uh, for the rest of the, the structure. And so you can see there's a lot of attenuation where that boat is leaking salt water on the deck. And we can locate that pretty effectively with GPR. Now, does that mean that these yellow and red areas are damaged delaminations right now? Not necessarily. They could be, but it doesn't mean it's damaged today. Will it be damaged in the near future? Possibly. And so we really want to start to look at, well, what do we want to do to preserve that? And we can do, you know, chain drag to see if there are any delaminations that need to be fixed. Maybe this is a reason, okay, let's just mill the surface of the eastbound lane for the first half and replace that with a, you know, a better, you know, maybe a latex modified or some kind of more impermeable overlay that'll help protect that area due to this exposure. Um, and so there, you know, this provides us an area of focus. We can look at the eastbound lane, the rest of the areas we can leave alone and we can focus our repair dollars to this first half of the eastbound lane. Um, you know, chain drag is a non-destructive testing technique. Uh, it's a very important method. 
um, you know, even though it is basic and easy, it's very important and I find it a very useful tool. Um, and I think it's critical in all bridge inspection. Uh, you know, it's very effective at finding large near surface delaminations. Um, you know, it's important to know its limitations though. So if you're doing chain drag or hammer sounding, if you hear that hollow sound to indicate a delamination, it's rare that that's not a uh, delamination. So if you hear the delamination, you have a very high confidence that a de the delamination deterioration exists. So false positives are very rare. If you hear that delamination, it's very rare that that's, that, that concrete is good and sound. So it's very good at, if it, you know not having false positives. Now a false negative though is very common. Just because your chain drag, if you don't hear the delamination sound, that doesn't mean damage doesn't exist. And the reason for that is we're limited in our ability to locate deterioration due to our human hearing. So hammer sounding chain drag, you're impacting the concrete surface, imparting stress waves into the concrete and listening for the acoustic response. And our human hearing only has a certain range of acoustic hearing. And so if those delaminations are very small or just beginning, we won't hear them because they don't change the pitch enough. And so that leads me into a method where we can use a little bit fancier sensor than just our ear. Uh, impact echo. And really this is just fancy chain drag, right? It's the same procedure. Impact echo is you're imparting a stress wave into the concrete and that stress wave is vibrating based on the thickness of that element. And if there's deterioration, in that cross section at the area of testing, that will affect the frequency. Now it's just got a more sensitive ear so that you can hear more subtle changes in that frequency. And so instead of, you know, hammer sounding DLAM can only find these serious delaminations, that incipient delaminations it can find with impact echo because you're picking up those really high frequency things that you can't hear with our human hearing. And so we can more better define the extent of delaminations because we can pick them up more subtly with impact echo. Now we also use an array, a sensor array. So impact echo is really off the initial sensors of our sensor array. However, because we use an array, we can also get waves that are transporting horizontally. So not only do waves bounce up and down in the concrete section when we create that stress wave, they go horizontally. And by using a sensor array, we can measure the velocity of the time it takes for that wave to travel between the array of the sensors. And because we know the known distance between those sensors, we can calculate that wave velocity. And if there are changes in that velocity at locations on a deck or pier or abutment, then we know that's areas of cracking. And so Together, impact echo and pulse velocity can really identify the extent of cracking and delamination much more accurately than delamination survey can. And so we can get a much better picture of where that damage is going. And so here's an example of you know, our, our deck system, scanning the deck, identifying where those delaminations are, where the micro cracking is, where the macro cracking is, so that we know where areas of deterioration are. You can see there's a lot of deterioration around the expansion joints of this bridge. Uh, and you can see other little pockets of maybe some just micro cracking. Maybe that's not enough to warrant a repair yet, but looking at those quantities, we can look at, okay, what's damaged today? What's gonna be damaged in the next 10 years? Does it warrant doing maybe an overlay now or, OK, maybe we wait in a few years and start budgeting for an overlay in five years based on this. In addition, that wave velocity can really help us understand compressive strength and it really gives us an estimate. So the faster that horizontal wave and I'll back up real quick here. So the faster this wave horizontally travels, it it incre speed increases in more dense materials. So the denser the concrete, the faster the wave travels and density has a, a strong relationship to strength as well. So effectively, as the wave velocity increases, that apparent compressive strength is also increasing. And so we have this curve where we can relate the wave velocity to strength. And so we can get an in-situ apparent compressive strength of the concrete by doing that pulse velocity testing over a structure. And the results of that look like something like this. So this is, you know, an abutment wall. We're seeing a joint here where there was some leaking. So if we do that survey, what we see is where we're seeing a lot of weakened concrete, low compressive strength. That's because of cracking and deterioration in that concrete. Uh, and we see certain circles here. The circles that have the cross through them, those are areas where we sounded and we found a delamination. And then you can see that those delaminations extend only to a certain area, 
but we see weakened concrete extending beyond that. So if I start chipping out this area, it's going to grow significantly beyond that. And so this gives us a better idea of the overall quantity of repair that we're going to ultimately have to do as opposed to just sounding work. And then we can also see areas of where we see higher strength concrete. Another tool we use the impact echo for pulse velocity for is looking for post tension grout voids. Um, voids in post tensioning grouting process are very difficult to identify because some tendons are internal to the concrete section and even tendons that are external are in ducts. And so it's very hard to visually or physically identify where those voids are. Um, and it can lead to some dangerous problems. So identifying where these grout defects are are very important. So if we do impact echo pulse velocity directly over tendons, if there is a defect in the grouting process, we can identify because that wave is gonna travel around those anomalies. And these anomalies include air or water voids or soft grout issues. And so if we see a deviation in the impact echo or pulse velocity signal while testing directly over tendons, then we know that's an indication of, of an anomalous grout issue. And so then we can use boroscope or another method to assess those. And so, you know, this is an example of what that looks like, you know, looking at vertical tendons in a pier, uh, transverse deck tendons, uh, longitudinal tendons inside the box. So looking at all these different types of tendons, we can identify where those, where those issues are and map those out. And so you can see here's kind of an example of, of what those results look like. You see areas where we've done testing. Uh, you can see the red areas indicate where there are voids. Uh, these are vertical U tendons and you can, they're you know 100 feet tall or so. You can see we're seeing voids of 15 feet, eight feet, things like that. And then using a boroscope to visually inspect those, those conditions of inside those voids. And so impact echo pulse velocity is a very fast, efficient way to locate that deterioration. Um, you know, and we can do it also on external tendons. It's a little simpler just because we have access to the tendon itself. So we can put the sensors on either side. Uh, you know, this is what a good tendon that's fully grouted would look like. Nice, clean signal. And then when there's a void, you can see how the signals go quite crazy. And so by looking at the signal analysis over the length, we can delineate where those defects are. Uh, and then when we find those defects, we want to do a boroscope inspection to put eyes on what is the issue. You know, sometimes we find, uh, you know, voids and there's no corrosion of the strands because it stayed sealed. Uh, other times we find those voids with a lot of corrosion and it really depends on the environment and what's happening with that structure. Um, and so, you know, we get a lot of different things that we can see here um, where you can see, you know, corrosion inside the duct. Uh, we can look at the anchorages. Um, sometimes we see water. Um, you know, on a vertical tendon, sometimes water can pool in those. Um, so that's important to understand the alkalinity of that water. Is it corrosive water or is it alkaline water? Um, you know, sometimes it's not seven wire strands. Sometimes it's, you know, tension bars like a Dewey Dag bar. Um, so, you know, there's all sorts of types of conditions. And, you know, once we find the anomaly with the impact echo pulse velocity, we can then go visually inspect that. Um, you know, like I said, you know, with the boroscope, sometimes those voids are an issue and sometimes those voids aren't an issue. You know, here we have two boroscope inspections of a PT void. The one on the left, we see the strands are exposed and on the right, we see the strands are actually at the bottom of the duct. Now, obviously we have a two voids in, in this, but the one on the left, the strands are not in that alkaline grout, so they're less protected. While we do have a void on the right, the strands are encased in good alkaline grout. So while the void isn't ideal, as long as the strands are encased, usually they're well protected because the alkalinity of the grout provides that corrosion protection. So, you know, sometimes we find defects that aren't necessarily uh, detrimental to the surface life of the structure. And so, you know, there's a, you know, that's importance of doing visual confirmation on some of these anomalies as we find them. Another, uh, you know, way we use the acoustic methods is we can actually kind of image a structure by doing a lot of shots over a grid, and we call this tomography. Uh, here we have a bridge pier uh, that's suffering from pretty severe freeze thaw damage. You can see the surface concrete is, is turning to rubble. We see a lot of exposed steel that's corroding, and you know this bridge is going to go under rehab. And you know, looking at this pier, it's like, well, is that pier worth salvaging? And you know, freeze thaw damage progresses in from the outside. So the question really becomes, you know, is that freeze thaw damage deep or is the core concrete still good? 
And so by doing through shots where we have, you know, the impact source on one side and we have the receiver on another and doing detailed grids, we can map that structure and identify how deep that freeze thaw damage is. And if it's only a few inches, maybe it makes sense to remove and replace that surface and keep that here. If we're seeing a lot of damage throughout, then, you know, maybe that's worth uh, replacing that element. And so we have to, you know, we can provide a lot of good information that will lead to decision making on the repair and replacement of the structure. Um, and, you know, also it can be used for repair assessment. So here is tomography of an element and we had these red dots here show where a crack was. So this was a new construction. There was some cracking into the concrete. And so they were going to do epoxy ejection repair. But the owner wanted verification that the contractor fully injected these cracks properly. And so by doing tomography before and after the repair, we can see that the cracks are present before, but once the epoxy fills that void properly, those voids are gone. And so we can have good confirmation that that repair was done and, and can provide some assurance to the owner that it was done correctly and gives the contractor confidence that he's completed his job correctly. And we can also, another you know, useful tool for the acoustic methods is pile length testing. Um, you know, something we come across a lot in the load rating support area is, you know, sometimes um, pile driving reports aren't provided. And so, you know, sometimes we don't know how long those piles are, how deep those are. So we can use the Impact Echoes device uh, in a little bit modified form, impact the top of the pile, send the stress wave down. The time it takes to come down and back up, we divide by two and we know the length of the pile. If there's major damage, significant damage, we might get an early reflection. So if we're testing several piles on a bent and one comes up very shallow, then we know there's serious damage at that depth. And we can do concrete, but also timber and steel piles because sometimes you know, concrete bridges are supported by non-concrete foundations. And so any kind of pile um, material, you can do this testing to verify the length of that element. And again, this is very helpful in those non in the, when we're lost to as builds or we don't know the conditions of those or even to verify proper driving so with that i'd really open uh, the floor to questions if there's anyone who has any i'd be happy to answer as many as i can excellent presentation there brian uh yeah we've gotten uh, a lot of questions uh flooding in here so we'll we'll try excellent. to see how many we can get through um yeah, so get your questions in now if you have any more. Uh, if you do not get to it, uh, we'll pass on this whole list to Brian and he'll he'll uh, get to them as uh, I'll after our show spend here. Spend my weekend answering questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let's start with Matt had a bunch of good questions here. He's been spamming us. I think he really wants that gift card. But. Um, <laughs> Have you ever done CSE testing on brand new concrete deck and, and what type of CSE readings uh, would new concrete have? So when you mean CSE, you're using corrosion potential copper sulfate electrode. Um, so, so yeah, so on a new, I guess it depends on your definition of new, right? So if they cast the deck 10 days ago and I did a corrosion potential survey on it, it would look like everything is actively corroding. And the reason for that is because the concrete's still hydrating. It has a lot of moisture in it. So uh, where we have a lot of moisture, it's going to move the potentials more negative. So for example, a pile in a marine environment, if I measure at the top of the pile and I walk down with the half cell down the pile to the water level, the potentials are naturally going to drift to more negative because of saturation. So that doesn't mean it's corroding though. So you know, I wouldn't, it's not going to give you any meaningful information really at new, at quote unquote brand new construction. Now, once that concrete's hydrated and hit equilibrium, let's say, you know, at least, uh, you know, 21 days, but probably even a little bit longer, I'd wait maybe, you know, to give it a few months, six months, then the measurements should be very ockable. Um, and you should see very positive numbers because everything should be passive because that concrete is nice and alkaline. Um, so you really should see very positive numbers. You know, you probably get something in, you know, negative 150 or even positive 100. So. Excellent. We got uh, th this one came up and it's a it's a classic question with uh, with GPR. Can you uh, test for how uh, what size or what diameter your bar is? Right. So GPR cannot really give you diameter, 
Um, you know, if it's a number 11 bar versus a number four, I can see the big difference there, but I can't tell you what a number six or a number five is. You know, I, if one's a six and a five, I couldn't see any difference there. So if you need to confirm bar size, we really just have to do a small chip out to verify that with calipers. Um, so there's really not a good non-destructive way to do it. Um, there are some magnetic uh, cover, meet, cover depth meters uh, that can give you kind of a close approximation. Um, and if you use GPR to get a cover depth, so like let's say, okay, hey, I know I have two inches of cover on this bar. A lot of the magnetic cover meters, you can say, hey, I have two inches on this bar. What's your best guess on diameter? And it helps it get a little bit closer, but generally you're going to be plus or minus a bar size anyway with that. Um, so really, unfortunately, GPR is not that great at, at giving you a bar size. Right, and with the, the box beam uh, example that you had earlier, uh, you were able to find uh, what the diameters were. Uh, or was that, did you have to do like a partial depth? Yeah, uh, so that was inspection? just a small chip out at at specific location just to verify that. And can, uh, can GPR identify if there's active corrosion uh, in the underlying rebar? So as I go, as I went back to the attenuation part, um, corrosion activity and progression and cracking will attenuate the GPR signal, but it, you can't discern from the attenuation what is corrosion and what might just be moisture um, at an area. So, so yes, it does get a, affect that GPR signal, but if you do a GPR survey and you say, hey, everywhere there's attenuation, that's corrosion, you would be wrong actually in that. Now, it could be corrosion in the near future, but it doesn't mean it is at that moment. So I really caution people, it's really a way to what it actually is most close to is electrical resistivity of the concrete. If you did an electrical resistivity of the concrete survey, you would have a very good correlation with GPR because that's really what's affecting that attenuation. Now, where areas of low resistivity are will allow corrosion to occur, but that doesn't mean it is occurring. And I think that's an important caveat. Right. Um, another another GPR question. Uh, can you, uh, I guess, measure or or see uh, rows below the top level? Uh, can you see into into different layers or? It, it depends on the spacing of the top layer. So say in a bridge deck where you might have bars on six inch or eight inch spacing, generally speaking, that's sufficient enough that I can see usually the second layer, as long as it's not too, too deep. Uh, now, let's say for an ashto type girder, where you have the pre-stress strands very tightly, like two inches on center in the bottom, from the bottom of the beam, I usually can't see the second layer. I kind of have to scan the side to see that there's a second layer. So if the spacing's really tight, then that starts to mask what's below it. Um, but generally, in, and, and also if it's really deep, right? If I was on a pier that was two feet thick, I wouldn't be able to see the far side of rebar there. But on a bridge deck, generally speaking, usually we can see both layers. Um, but once it starts getting tight, you know, I would say kind of four inches and below, we, it starts to mask anything below that for sure. Have you ever seen Impact Echo used as a QC measure to evaluate the tendon grouting during construction? Not so much during construction. You would want to, again, kind of back to the moisture thing with the half cell, you couldn't do it directly after grouting because all that moisture that's hydrating in the grout, you would need to let it cure. So if you did the impact echo, say, two months after grouting, you could then verify that it was good, but you couldn't do it. Like if the contractor grouted last week, it would almost, it would indicate that it was all anomalous just because there's too much moisture in that grout still. It needs to hydrate more. So, so it can be done. I have not seen it been done personally yet. Uh, most of it's been doing on existing structures that we're going back to look at, but I think it would be a useful tool to catch that stuff much earlier than what we're finding now. Right. Um, Caitlin says testing inspection and reporting methods uh, that you're discussing here are typically above and beyond the minimum federal standards. Um, how do you encourage owners to to uh, to spend and to uh, uh, justify uh, the higher level of testing and inspection and reporting? Well, I think it really comes down to you know, you know, it, on the biannual inspections, the normal inspections. I don't think it's appropriate for those. But when the structure starts coming up to a point where it's like, hey, we need to rehabilitate this structure and we need it to last 50 more years or 30 more years or 75 more years because that's what we need for our DOT. Then it becomes very 
economical to do those up more advanced stand uh, testing methods because if we don't do good repairs at the start then we're not going to get that service life and they're going to have to come back and do repairs um, sooner than they had wanted to so i think it really comes down to when you get into that repair cycle helping to delineate those those that damage more accurately and understand what we need to fix now so that we can preserve it. So, so I would agree in the federal standards with like biannual inspection, it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but um, it is very useful. I think once the decision is made that, hey, we do want to start looking at repair or restoration or service life extension of this element of the structure, then that becomes a very, very useful tool to help ensure the repairs that you in that you're designing are going to last the intended time. The owner is going to get that extension and it will be uh, really preserved. Um, here's one. So we tested, uh, so they tested a structure and they found some delaminations. Uh, they then removed the delaminated concrete and did the repair. Do they need to then retest the structure? Well, I guess it depends on what the ultimate goal is, right? And it comes back down to service life, right? If if we're just doing some delam repair because we're trying to extend that bridge deck five years or that pier element five or six years because we're going to do something later or it's going to get torn down or then maybe no. If you did that patch repair with the expectation that it's going to last, that pier or deck is going to last 30 more years, then maybe it is worthwhile to do a little bit more testing to identify where is damage beyond that or and do maybe some preservation techniques. So I think it all comes back to, you know, the service life and requirements of that structure in the future, because, you know, if it's a, you know, a short term thing, then maybe it doesn't. If it's a long term thing, I think it really does pay off to do. So it really depends on the circumstances there. I'm anonymous here, so hopefully they'll uh, they'll reply with their their name. But uh, what about underwater investigations? Do you have similar survey assessments or can you use these technologies to work underwater? So some of these technologies do work underwater, like some of the acoustic methods we do have fit out for um, that can be handed to a diver and done underwater. Uh, there are corrosion testing that can be done in the water relatively easily. Um, so some of them do transfer into the water, I would say that they become a little less detailed underwater just because you know diving and inspecting if anyone on here is a diver who does inspection you'll know that it's just like really tough to know where you are and see and so it's a little harder to kind of get in exact profiles and stuff but you you can assess things down there so yeah a lot of these methods can be used down there to give you kind of more of a broad sense of what's going on under the water as opposed to kind of a you know i showed a lot of good detailed maps a lot of times you're not going to get that from under the water. You're going to get more kind of a general picture of what's going on under there. Uh, we had a question here. Can you uh, install ICCP uh, in a structure after it's been built? Uh, yep, so colleagues in further webinars, I think we'll touch on that a lot more, but I'll give a I'll happily answer that. But yeah, um, impress current cathodic protection can be installed on existing structures as a rehabilitation and I forget who, but in the next couple, there are going to be talks on doing just that. So if you're interested in that topic, I highly encourage you to watch some of the future uh, webinars that are going to be provided by the National Concrete Bridge Council. Um, here from, from Mason, what is the maximum depth the GP, that GPR is effective? Depends on the GPR that you're using. Um, for the GPR that I showed in my presentation, that's going to be around 18 or so inches. That's a really high frequency ground coupled array for really detailed information from a structure. Now we have radars that are good for soils and we can see several feet, tens of feet below the ground. And we can use those to identify where footers are um, and different foundation types and things like that. So, you know, it depends on the array and what you're looking for. Generally speaking, though, the deeper you see, the less resolution you get. So, you know, if I scan a deck with the, you know, the high frequency antenna, I can see each individual rebar. If I use a lower frequency to scan more deeper, I may not see each individual bar. I may see just a layer of reinforcement. I can't de delineate the specific bars. So you lose some horizontal resolution, but you can gain depth. So depends on what you're trying to do, but uh, varied in radars we can get. But for reinforced concrete structures, Generally, about twelve to eighteen inches is kind of where where we're at with the good with the high resolution systems. Right. Uh, we got another one here from Anonymous. Uh, how accurate is impact echo in determining pile length? Uh, we usually within about five percent, so we plus or minus five percent of the length. 
All right, and I think we'll do just one more question here. Uh, how accurate can you predict voids in PT tendons with GPR? With GPR, uh, pretty much not at all. Uh, generally because the ducts are usually metal, so that's going to reflect all the GPR energy. Um, so if you have voids in um, your ducts, in, uh, acoustic methods are the way to go. If you're trying to find voids or in concrete, acoustics are better because the speed of sound in concrete is much faster than in air. If you're trying to find steel in concrete, electromagnetic GPR is better. So GPR would not be very good at finding voids in, in PT. All right. And I think we're going to uh, end the Q&A there for now. If you're interested in our future webinars in our uh, concrete durability series, or as uh, Greg mentioned, we're going to be doing one every month up until I believe March. Uh, you can go to our website at wesavestructures.info and uh, register for all of those. I think next month is with uh, Chris Ball. He's going to be presenting on uh, Don't Patch It, Repair It. So it's going to be detailing all different types of uh, long lasting uh, repair strategies. Thank you, Brian, for putting on this awesome presentation. And uh, thank you, Greg, for doing that uh, awesome intro for Brian and for uh, putting together this uh, awesome uh, collaboration between our, our organizations. We're all trying to do the, the same mission here, trying to provide uh, information to the industry on best ways to preserve our, our world's bridges. Right. Out outstanding. Well, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. And thank you, uh, Brian. Outstanding presentation. And uh, as Ben said, I'll echo, we, we very much appreciate the partnership. Uh, encourage everyone to come back uh, next month as we continue this conversation on stewardship um, of our bridges. So, so thank you. Thank you, National Concrete Bridge Council for this opportunity. Thank you everyone for attendance. Have a nice day.